So you've got all your colors picked out and your model base coated. Now what? Recently in the One Page Rules Discord, someone mentioned that they've got the idea and concept of base coating down, but don't really know where to go from there. And this gave me an idea. What if this week's challenge, I base coat models their normal colors that they would be, but then I'm only allowed to use one single color, either shade or highlight from there. But not only that, make a comprehensive guide about when, where, and how to use those basic shades and highlights. Well, there's no what ifs here, so let's get to it. And boy, do I have a lot of models to choose from this month. So instead of picking one, I'm going with a whole sample of stuff from this month's One Page Rules Pedra, since I won't be able to show every technique on a single miniature. So from the Duchies of Vinci, I have a drone and militia man, and from the mummified undead, I'm using a temple guard and guardian statue with spear. I've got them all base coated already, with all the colors I'll be using. This was done over a dark grey base coat until every base color was flat and opaque. To start with, I'm going to be going over the shading techniques, including washes in contrast, glazing, and black lining. Washes are a simple way to get darker shadows by using fluid and transparent paint to pool in recesses. They're mostly useful in areas with heavy textures like fur, chainmail, or debris, as well as deeply recessed areas like cloth folds, or used to pick out reliefs in armors, shields, and stone. Washes can come pre-made, like in the case of GW or Army Painter shades. The wood on this drone is a perfect candidate for a wash, as not only will it darken the edges by using the brush to drag it to the edges, letting it pool where the wood and metal meet, but it will also get inside the texture of the wood paneling that was sculpted. I started with a brighter brown base so that it'll show through the dark wash once dry. Once it dries, it should look darker in the edges and recesses as those parts dried with more pigment than the areas it pulled away from. If it's not dark enough for you though, you can always add a second or even third wash, especially near the edges, until you're happy with the shade. Contrast paints are also technically washes, though they contain much more pigment and are a bit more viscous than a regular wash. They go on much darker as a result, so if that's what you want, by all means use it, but they can also be thinned down with water or thinner to act more like a regular wash, which I'm doing here, and it can save you from having to get two different paints for the same thing. Washes can also work on gentle recesses like the folds in this cloth, where the wash will pull away from the high curves and settle in the deep ones. Washes may also be made using just regular paints as well, which I'm doing here. However, this is best done by using a thinning medium instead of just water, as pigments may dry dusty looking in recesses if the water pools too much, because there wasn't enough binder left in the paint to properly set the pigments. Glazing is like washes in that you use a thinned transparent mix of paint, but instead of letting it pool heavily in the recesses, you apply it more evenly and in more coats. It's useful for blending between shades, but also tinting to other colors, and in this case, acting as a wash for fine details. Glazing with a wash or shade paint as well as contrast is possible. I'm using an Argrax Earthshade on the wings here. After getting it on my brush, I remove a bit of it onto a paper towel so that the brush is still damp, but not saturated. I pull the glaze back towards the recesses or areas I want the darkest, in this case, towards the middle of the propellers. You then let that layer dry completely and repeat the process afterwards, but in a smaller area than before. The more times you do this, the darker the areas you glaze most will be, giving a soft transition from the base layer to the shade. Because glazes are quite thin, they will settle a bit into small crevices and around edges still, meaning that as you glaze flat areas with some etching, they'll settle into it and darking up those etchings like a wash while you create the blends with multiple applications. The amount of times you have to apply a glaze is based on how much you dilute it. A more opaque glaze will be quicker, but a more transparent glaze will give a more gradual transition. Glazing has a lot of applications in both shading and highlighting, so this won't be the only time we see it in this video. Lining, commonly referred to as black lining, is the process of adding thin lines with a fine brush to deep thin recesses and along points where two separate objects meet. It's useful for adding shadows and contrast in thin areas as well as more easily separating two objects that are completely different from each other, like skin and armor. 
Despite its name, black lining doesn't need to be done with black at all, but usually a darker shade of your base color. Using a small, thin brush that has a longer tip is what I find the best for lining, but anything with a good point will do. The paint should be thin so it flows nicely, but still opaque, so not thinned as much as a wash might be. While it looks very precise, the hardest part is getting the brush into the groove you intend to line. Once it's there, you can usually just follow the sculpt of the model easily to line the recess. Even small areas like the rivets on his chest follow the same idea once you've made contact. You just have to move around the line where the two parts meet. Anywhere where two very different colors or materials meet is a good place for a black line, like between the inner and upper parts of this guy's shield here. It will visually create a separation while sparing you from needing the base coats to line up exactly where they meet in those deep recesses. Black lining can be used to outline extruded textures and motifs as well as making beveled lines or textures more apparent. But if you use a lighter color instead, they can also create a glow effect as though the light is coming from inside the beveled area. Moving on to the light side of the painting force, we have layering, stippling, glazing again, edge highlighting, and dry brushing to go over. Layering, as the name may suggest, is to add layers on top of each other to lighten an area with a lighter, opaque, or semi-opaque color, covering previous work, but leaving some of it showing. It can find use practically everywhere on every part of a model, but isn't always the quickest of methods if speed is your goal. At its core, layering starts on the palette. Either by laying out paints you intend to use and arranging the colors based on lightness, or by creating a series of mixes from one color to another. Each one being a step in the layering process. Since I'm only allowed one step for my challenge, I only have one color to worry about. As you thin a paint for a layer, you have to decide how opaque you want it to be. Paint straight from the bottle or pot will be the most opaque, and depending on color, will cover the best but the edges around the area where you paint it will be more apparent that way. By thinning the paint, it can become semi-opaque and allow some of the previous color to show through. Because the muscle of this guy's body are more rounded, I prefer a more semi-opaque, so the edges aren't as apparent. Layering is also good for lighting up small areas that don't have a sharp edge or a large surface. As with the skeleton's face here, a layer can allow you to pick out everything you want highlighted. Simply by touching your brush to it, picking out all the fingers and toes separately as well, leaving behind what's in the spaces between them. Layering can be used as the opposite to black lining, where black lining leaves a solid color in the middle but darkens the edges, a layer can also lighten an area while leaving the edges alone. In the case of this militiaman's ruffles, I want the white part of the ruffle to cover more of the edges than the red parts, so instead of black lining, I layer a lighter red into the middle of those ruffles so that the shade doesn't creep up the sides where I've based them for white. Stippling is adding small dots to a surface in order to create texture and blending. The more tightly packed the dots are, the lighter that surface will be, whereas looser grouping will create transitions. It's used to make texture on cloth and leather, as well as more easily highlighting rounded sections like shoulder pads. Stippling is great for cloth like cloaks and sashes, as it creates a textured pattern along with the blend as you'd expect that kind of material to have. The best way to start it is by poking your brush, damp with paint over the surface sporadically, placing less dots the further away from the edges that you're trying to highlight you go. Then on your lightest area, go and add even more dots to saturate the area with them. It's okay if this creates a solid color in the middle of your highlight, as long as they eventually start to break apart where you want the blend to exist. Stippling doesn't have to be perfect circles as well. Small lines or scratches also work to make texture and highlight at the same time, especially on leathers. By combining stipples and scratches is how you get a rough leather look, focusing the grouping along the edges as well as adding various scratches. For this kind of stippling, it might be better to use a fine brush to do the scratches, as I find they look better when thinner and can always be done after the initial stippling. If you have trouble with other blending methods, stippling I think is by far the easiest to learn and get great results from. It can be done with brushes that don't have the best point either, as texture is the name of the game. So if you have tried blending and can't quite get it, start with stippling. It really doesn't take much longer, and mastered can be contest winning worthy. If you need an example of that, check out Elroy101 on Instagram. I'll put a link in the description. We're going back to glazing again because glazing can work in both directions. When it comes to highlighting with glazing, 
It works best on rounded highlights like cloaks or cloth folds, or to soften sharp highlights by glazing between the base and highlight. The method is the same as it is for shades, but instead of a dark color, it's using a lighter one. By starting with an overall layer nice and thin, you can add more and more layers of the glazes towards your highlight points to make them brighter, making sure each layer dries fully before starting again. Drying shouldn't take too long though, as your brush should only be damp with the glaze. If it seems too wet and watery, sap more of it out of the brush onto a paper towel. Glazing is also used to soften transitions from one brightness to another. In the case of the white ruffles on this malicious pants, while I want the point and edge to be pure white, by glazing along the slope, those edges become less abrupt and the colors ease in together. Similarly, when you've added texture to a flat surface through stippling or another method coming up, you can glaze between the base and that highlight with the same highlight color to soften those edges out. They'll still be visible below the glaze, but will have a more gentle transition to them. It's a good method for getting a nice non-metal metal on blades using only a brush. Edge highlighting, as the name may suggest, is to add solid highlights along sharp edges using the tip or the edge of a brush. This is very commonly used in Games Workshop's gallery miniatures. It has good use for sharp edges like sword blades and squared armor. It also works to outline small sections of plated armor like on a lot of sci-fi miniatures. The basic idea behind any edge highlight is to outline a sharp edge by using a fine brush and an opaque fluid paint. Draw the tip of the brush along the edge without putting too much pressure on it so that the bristles don't separate. It'll take some dexterity to follow the edge and stay within it, but if the edge is away from other surfaces enough, it actually becomes very easy. By using the side of the brush, which acts like a flat surface, we can slide it along the protruding edge. Because the brush is flat in this orientation, it can only go so far into the edge. Like with stippling, you can add scratches that run off the edges to create texture along the flat surface. Edge highlighting can work like black lining as well to separate smaller flat plates. Like on the gold neck part here, I can highlight the edges of the gold, but also each individual plate in the center to give each its separation from the others. You can layer edge highlights like you can flat layers by starting with thicker lines and as you make steps up in the brightness, make them narrower. It can also be used to create texture like on blades and reflective surfaces. By drawing lines into a surface parallel with your starting edge, you make a brushed metal kind of look, which is a good start for non-metal metal before the glazing. Dry brushing is a form of edge highlighting that makes mostly dry pigments catch raised edges as they're rubbed over it. It's quite a rough method and shouldn't be done with good or expensive brushes. It works best on things with lots of sculpted texture like fur, chainmail, rocks, coarse skin, feathers, and usually the elements on bases. To get a dry brush, take your cheap or worn brush and get the bristles saturated with unthinned paint. Wipe the brush on a paper towel vigorously until it has very little moisture left in the bristles, then repeatedly stroke the brush against the grain of the texture you want to pick out. So in the case of this guy's skirt, down along all the edges instead of cross with them. The dried pigments will become picked out by those sharp edges. It does leave a little dusty texture behind, but sometimes that's exactly what you want. As for the challenge itself, the only part I cheated on a bit was the malicious metallic shoulder armor and boots, as I wanted him to fit in with the rest of the army I've painted. Otherwise, I think all the different techniques all came together really well to show that it doesn't matter which ones you master and which ones you don't. You only need one or two to make a model look nice. And with all of them, it's the practice that will get you there. So don't be shy to focus on a single technique that you enjoy working with the most. There are a few techniques that I didn't cover in this list because they didn't really fit the experiment and are a bit more advanced. Two brush blending, wet blending, and loaded brush. I've used those techniques in other videos, but each one would require a little more in-depth explanation than I would be able to give them in the format of this video. If you like the models and want to know where you can get them yourself, check the link in the description. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.